Welcome back everybody to our day one afternoon session of the Sparks 2014 conference. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Catherine Lord. Catherine's research has focused on the evolution and development of dog and wolf behaviour. This pursuit has involved thousands upon thousands of hours observing hand-reared puppies of both domestic dogs and wolves. It's a tough job, but somebody has to do it. Um, Catherine's currently a visiting professor at Hampshire College and regularly lectures throughout the US and internationally. She recently appeared on Inside Animal Minds, a PBS and BBC Nova production, and regularly lectures, um, as I said, throughout the US and internationally. Today, she's offering insight into the topic of barking and conflict. So let's give a warm welcome to Catherine. Great, hello, and thank you very much for having me. Um, I, I realize I can hardly see you guys out there, so I will try to um, remember where you are. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you about some work I've done on barking and conflict. And I have two main questions that I'm really interested in as far as barking is considered. The first is, why do dogs bark? And this may seem like a fairly elementary question, as we tend to learn that dogs bark when we're around three years old, and most of you have probably heard them making this vocalization every day since. And in fact, many of you here have probably been asked to deal or fix nuisance barking. But despite its seeming omnipresence, we actually do not know the function of this vocalization. Now, one of the reasons for this may be that some of the methodology we usually apply to determining the function of vocalizations are a little tricky to apply to the dog bark. So the first method we tend to use is the context in which we see the vocalization. So if we're always seeing an animal produce a vocalization in uh, a context where there's a predator, say, we have some idea that that's probably an alarm vocalization. If we look more closely at that context, we may be able to determine further, more specific functions for that vocalization. The problem with doing that with dogs and barking is that dogs bark in seemingly unending contexts. In fact, it's probably easier to determine what context they don't bark in than what context they do bark in. So it's not a very helpful methodology for this particular species and this particular vocalization. The other method we can use is looking at the structure of the sound itself, and we can find a lot of information from that, including things like how far will that sound travel, and therefore who will receive that sound, and even sometimes the motivation or the internal state of the animal producing the sound. But again, this is tricky to apply to the dog bark because not only do they produce the bark in multiple contexts, but they actually change how their bark sounds in those different contexts. So I'd like to give you a little example. A lot of you thinking back probably realize that this occurs, but I'm gonna give you a specific example here of a single dog, and I'm gonna play you a sa the sound of her barking in response to playing with her owner, and then I'm gonna play you the sound of her barking in response to someone knocking at the door, a stranger knocking at the door. So first, let me play you the response to play. All right, so that's her playing with her owner. Same dog now, but someone, a stranger, has just knocked on the door. All right, so both of those are things you'd probably consider barks, but they sound quite different. Specifically, that first bark had a higher pitch, right? The note you heard sounded higher than the stranger bark. Another difference is the time in between repetitions. So you had a bark, a pause, a bark, a pause, a bark, and the pauses in the first bark, in that play bark, were longer than the pauses in the second bark. And finally, something that's a little harder to hear is that the first bark was more tonal. It sounded more like a note, where the second bark was more noisy. Think of white noise, that sort of chaos, like you hear in a growl. It had more of that to it. So now that I've told you the differences, I'm gonna play those barks again for you. So here's the play bark. 
So high pitched tonal, and there's some space between barks. And here's the stranger bark. All right, so these differences in structure make it a little difficult for us to determine um, any function from that because they vary. So my second main question is why do dogs bark so much? And I've already told you that they bark in lots of contexts, so that kind of sets this up. But this becomes an even more interesting question when we compare them to other closely, closely related species, um, so other members of the genus Canis. And this was mentioned earlier um, that wolves, jackals, coyotes, all of them actually bark, but dogs do it much more often. So wolves, coyotes, and jackal, jackals bark rarely, but we do see them do it in the wild. So where does this come from? Why are dogs suddenly increasing the frequency of this behavior so much? Why are they doing it in so many different contexts? So for the rest of this talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present two alternative hypotheses for why dogs bark. And then associated with each of those hypotheses is a hypothesis for why dogs bark so much. After I've explained a little theory behind those hypotheses and what they are, I'm going to go on to tell you about two experiments I conducted over the past year with some students of mine at Gettysburg College, looking to determine, uh, to test between these two hypotheses. All right, so hypothesis one. Hypothesis one states that dogs bark, not only do they vary between contexts, but their barks are specific to context. So they have a bark that sounds a certain way that they only produce in response to a certain situation or stimulus. If this is the case, then dogs could bark more than other species because they've been selected to communicate with humans. Now, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, so let me take a step back and explain the theory behind this. So first of all, if you bark, if you produce a vocalization in a specific context, and you only produce that sound in that specific context, then you could use that sound to refer to that context, very much like our words. I can say the word chair, and because I only use the word chair to re refer to something specific, you know what I'm talking about, even though I don't have a chair here, all right? So that's referential. Obviously, we can also associate that to all sorts of other things, so words get a little more complex than just being referential. But we have found other vocalizations in other animals that are referential. So the most famous among them, we already, we already heard about, from Patricia McConnell, is the vervet monkey. But I'm going to tell you about it again. <laughs> so um, as she mentioned, the vervet monkey was studied by uh, Cheney and Seyfarth. And when they were out there observing these monkeys, they noticed that they had these different sounding alarm calls depending on what predator was present. And so as she mentioned, they had a call for um, when leopards were present, another call when eagles were present, and I was not going to mention the snake thing because it gets a little more complicated, but I'll bring it up later. So just remember the snakes had to do with mobbing, and I'll be talking about mobbing behavior in a moment. So let's stick to the leopards and the eagles for now. So they noticed that these were two different sounding vocalizations, and when the scout produced this vocalization, they, uh, the rest of the troop responded in a specific way, but also in an adaptive way. So this was, a, this was a response that improved the likelihood of survival and reproduction in the troop. Okay, so this was not only, not only was it a specific response, but it was an adaptive response. So when they saw a, um, a leopard, they ran up into the tree, and so avoiding a predator on the ground, that's a good thing. And when they saw an aerial predator, like the eagle, they either looked up in the air or ran under a bush, or both. Um, again, that would be a good thing to see where that aerial predator is if you're about to get snatched up, and then to run for cover. Now, this is the part that, um, that Patricia didn't talk about. Cheney and Seyfarth did, did unending experiments, really, on this system. So this is just a little... Um, 
a little extra from what she talked about. So what they didn't know, this looks like it might be referential, right? We have a vocalization. It's a specific sound occurring in a specific context. And we're also having a specific reaction potentially to that call. But it's possible, as she mentioned, that those animals were getting their attention by giving those calls. The rest of the troop looked at the caller and then looked around, saw a leopard, and ran up a tree because they saw a leopard. Or they looked around and they saw an eagle and they went under a bush. So it might not have been that they were responding to something specific about that call, but just an attention-getting um, response and then responding appropriately to the stimulus that was present. So what they did was something called a playback study. Again, Patricia mentioned this. Um, so they recorded the calls of the, um, of the scout monkeys, played them back to the troop, but in the absence of any predator. So when there was no leopard around, they played the leopard call, and what they found, at least initially, was that everybody ran up the tree. Now eventually, they realized that this monkey was, call was, was crying wolf, so to speak, and they stopped responding, because they look around after they got up the tree and there was no leopard there. That was obviously an untrustworthy monkey. But they'd run up the tree in the absence of a leopard, and the same thing with the eagle. They gave the, they gave the recorded eagle call, no eagle around, and they looked up and ran under a bush. So this suggests that those monkeys were getting information from that vocalization and not just from the context that they were observing themselves. So this is um, good support that these calls are in fact referential. So if this hypothesis is correct, and dog barks are in fact context specific and referential, then dogs may bark more because they've been selected to communicate with us. Specifically, we're using those referential vocalizations just like the troop of vervet monkeys, right? So if we could take that information and use it to help us survive, then that would be a good thing. Now notice I'm talking about communication in a very specific way here. This is an evolutionary definition of communication. So you could think of communication just as someone putting a, a signal out and somebody else receiving it. But in evolutionary terms, communication specifically requires that both the sender of that signal and the receiver of that signal have some um, benefit from sending and receiving that signal. So for example, in the vervet monkey, the vervet monkey that sent the signal is likely helping its offspring and possibly relatives to survive, whereas those um, monkeys hearing the call are obviously avoiding predation and therefore helping themselves survive and reproduce. So that could be communication. So if this was a referential sound, then humans could potentially be using the barks to help themselves survive, say, knowing that there's a stranger outside the door and not going out there and getting hit with a club or something like that. And the dogs, it could be beneficial because if this was useful to humans, they may have better access to food. All right, so that's the first hypothesis. Um, before I go on, I did want to mention that there is some support for this hypothesis. The main support is in two forms. The first is that, on, in general, we've noticed that there is a trend for these differences between barks. For example, when I showed you the play bark, play barks tend to be high-pitched and tonal in contrast to stranger barks, which tend to be low-pitched and noisy, in contrast to alone barks, which tend to be high-pitched, um, long, and tonal, right? So we, we've seen some differences between these barks, and we've also seen that it is possible for humans and computers to discriminate between these contexts without knowing where the bark came from. So if you give a person five barks from five different contexts, they can guess above chance, so better than one in five times, which bark goes with which context. And so can a computer. So there's, there's some kind of structural difference there that we're picking up on. So that's the main support for this hypothesis right now. The second hypothesis is that dog barks still vary between contexts, but they are not context specific. And that variation between barks is not coming from external conflict, or external context, but to coin a phrase that Simone used earlier, it's coming from internal context. So it's coming from the um, motivation or the internal state of the animal. And if this is the case, 
then the, um, the reason dogs bark more may be, rather than them being selected to bark more, it may be a byproduct of them being becoming domesticated. So again, this may not make a lot of sense, so we need to take a step back and talk about the background of this. Um, so you'll notice also I have conflict noted up under there, specifically the internal um, state that we think is associated with barking in dogs, and this hypothesis is a conflict state. So in order to understand this, we need to look at the structure of sound, which I was talking about earlier. So when an animal makes a sound, for example, when a dog barks, this is produced by vibrations, specifically in the vocal cords. Those vibrations cause air particles to vibrate, which bump into each other and propagate that vibration out. Eventually, those vibrations reach someone's ear, like your ear. Those vibrations cause vibrations in your eardrum, which then cause vibrations in a whole bunch of small bones, and eventually those vibrations are translated into an electronic signal in your brain, which allows you to hear sound. Now, this seems kind of very abstract and difficult for us to understand because vibrating air particles is not something we can see, and therefore we have a hard time fathoming it. So it's a little more clear to think about the very same system happening in water. So when you have vibration in water, you get the same uh, propagation of vibration through water particles. Now we can see that vibration. And what does it look like? Well, in this case, we have a small vibration caused by a drop of water, and we get these ripples. A bigger vibration, you get bigger waves. So the very same thing is happening in the air particles. They're bumping into each other. They're pushing up against each other, causing pressure, which is pushing on the next set, and really what it's doing is causing waves through those air particles. So this is why we refer to them as sound waves. That's how they travel through the air. Once we get sound into a visual system, it makes our lives much easier. We can start measuring things, which we like to do as scientists. It's sort of our raison d'etre. So we have now here a uh, theoretical sound wave, right? So we just have this green line, which is some wave of sound out there. And we can start to measure things. One thing we can measure is the amplitude. So that's the distance from, try this, from the peak of the wave to the valley of the wave. And amplitude translates auditorily into volume, right? How loud something is. You have a bigger difference between those two things, a larger amplitude. You have a larger volume, a louder sound. We can also measure something called frequency, which is a little more complicated. It has to do with the distance between the peaks of the wave here, which is actually called wavelength. And frequency translates into a pitch of a sound. What frequency actually is, is how many waves go past a certain point in a given amount of time, say a second. So how many waves go past a given point in time in a second, we call that hertz, determines the frequency. The frequency translates auditorily into pitch. So if we have lots of waves close together, then we get lots of waves going past a single point in a short amount of time. That translates to a, a large frequency. We have a high pitch. Okay, so large frequency, high pitch. Here down below, we have our waves much further apart. So our peaks are much further apart. So if we look at the same time as this top graph here, we have much fewer waves in that given amount of time going past that same space. So that is a much lower frequency and a much lower pitch. So that's a deep sound. And finally, we can also measure duration. So that's from when the sound starts to when the sound ends. Now this is a great way to look at sound for determining those measurements. But if it's anything beyond a simple pure tone, it starts to get kind of hard to look at and, and analyze. So instead, we use a graph called a spectrogram. Um, Patricia referred to it earlier as a sonogram, exactly the same thing. It's just multiple words for the same thing. And on this um, type of graph, we have frequency on our y-axis, in this case measured in kilohertz, same thing as hertz, just times 1,000. Um, and on our x-axis, we have time. Now, 
What I'm going to do is I'm going to play you this sound that's shown here. This sound that's shown here is something called a lost call. We'll talk more about it in a minute. I'm going to play the sound, and what I want you to try to do is follow along. Notice there's three separate calls here. We have one here, two here, and the third there. So try to listen and see if you can follow along with those calls. Here we go. All right, so you heard three separate things. You can see three separate things there. Now let's get a little more in detail. So first, when you listen to that sound, it sounds like a note. It doesn't sound like a growl, it sounds like a tone. So that is something we call a very tonal sound, and we can see that on this graph by these bands. So you see a big band here, and then another little one there, bigger one there, same thing here, big band, littler bands above. That first band on the bottom is called fundamental frequency. That's the note you hear. Everything above that is called an overtone, and that's what creates the timbre. For those of you who are musicians, you know exactly what I'm talking about. For everybody else, if you were listening to a piano, a flute, and a clarinet play a C natural, doesn't really matter what that sounds like, a note, right? All the same note. Then that fundamental frequency, that bottom line, would be in the exact same place on this graph. And yet, you know that a flute and a clarinet and a, and a piano sound differently to you, even if they're playing the same note. There's something that sounds different. That's the overtones. So that's what produces that difference. All right, so these bands are tonal sounds. That's how we see tonal sounds. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention is the darkness of these lines, how dark they are. That's related to amplitude. So the darker the line, the louder the sound. All right. That is in contrast to this, which is a noisy sound. This is a growl, which I'll also play for you. Now, you notice we don't have those nice, discrete bands. Now we just have a whole bunch of energy across a whole bunch of frequencies. And that's very characteristic of noise. So let me play you this sound. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, no. I may have to impersonate it. There it is. <laughs> All right. So a little fast. But that is a very noisy sound, and we can tell that from that big band of energy. No, no nice little discrete bands. Okay, so that's noisy versus tonal. Now, before I continue on, we've heard a lot about motor patterns today. I just want to mention, we're looking at something a little different. We're used to thinking, um, Simone said, we, um, we look at these things. Ray was talking about um, motor patterns that we see. Well, these also are these vocalizations. You can think of them just the same. You can think of them as motor patterns. The movement that's happening is someplace that's difficult to see, right? It's the vocal cords. We hear it, but we can turn it into something we can see, which is those spectrograms. And we can make those very same measurements that, that um, Raymond Coppinger was talking about earlier. So we can look at the quality. The quality is just what you're looking at on the spectrogram, right? That's the shape. Instead of describing the shape of the animal in Orient, whose head is above its shoulders, whose eyes are focused on a potential prey item, nose, ears are also focused that way. So we can describe it um, as far as the shape of the outward animal. We can also describe the shape of the sound with these spectrograms, just like we would on an ethogram for any other motor pattern. And we can measure the same things. We can measure the quality. We can measure how often we see them. We can measure for how long they happen, and we can measure the sequencing. So I just wanted to make that connection really quickly for you. All right. So I mentioned when we look at the structure of a sound, we can sometimes determine the internal state of an animal. And that comes from something called Morton's Motivation Structural Rules, which have been fairly well um, supported over the years. These rules state that an animal producing, a, this can be for mammals or birds, an animal producing a low-pitched, noisy vocalization tends to have an agonistic internal state. And that sound is adapted to create distance between the sender and the receiver. So our growl is a perfect example of that, right? So the dog growls, that's a low-pitched, noisy sound. We tend to see that in agonistic situations. It makes sense that that would increase the distance. Alternatively, high-pitched tonal sounds um, tend to come from animals with an affiliative internal state. And those sounds are adapted to decrease the distance between the sender and the receiver. 
And that's just what the lost call does. So the lost call is actually one of those fixed action patterns, um, at least early on. And what usually happens is a puppy produces this. This is a two-week-old German Shepherd puppy, and it's the animal that made that sound I played to you earlier. And it's actually in the middle of an experiment that I was performing, where it was plunked down on the sheet, and then it was given um, a bunch of different stimulus to react to. In this case, it's supposed to be reacting to a smell. And after it sniffed around for a bit, it realized that it was not in its nest. And the main way it figures this out is through heat. At this age, they're really focused on how warm and cold they are. They aren't really good at regulating their own temperature. And so if they're in a place that they feel a little cold, they look for a warmer spot, and they follow that heat gradient until they reach a place where they're at a comfortable temperature, which is usually their nest. That's how they find their way home. If they find themselves in a place that's no warmer on any one side, they can't find their way home, they're lost, they produce the lost call. So the sign stimulus is that there's cold around them, there's no warm spots, they produce this sound. Interestingly, the response to this sound is also a fixed action pattern in the mothers during a very specific time period they will go and retrieve these puppies that are making this sound. In fact, Dr. Coppinger found they'd retrieve tape recorders that are making this sound too, and they'd put them back in their nest. That's just what they do. <laughs> now this puppy was out in uh, nowhere near its mother, so its mother couldn't hear it, and so I come to save it. Now, I'm gonna play you a little video clip of this pup. He kind of works up into those lost calls that I showed you, that I played for you a minute ago, and I just want you to notice um, when the sound stops. When does he stop making this call? All right, so he's going to work up to it. He's just realizing there's no warmth. So there's, there's my hand. As soon as that hand touches him, as soon as he feels warmth, he stops. So the motivation is no longer there. It's changed. Internal state has changed. Everything's good. Just goes towards the warmth. That's the, that's the next motor pattern, right? There's warmth thing. go towards that. So the high-pitched tonal sounds all tend to be associated with animals with these affiliative internal states. Okay, so that was fun. We talked about structure of, the structure of, uh, of vocalizations. Now we can get back to the bark. So what I'm showing you here is a spectrogram of a series of barks. Remember, we have frequency on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, and each one of these is a single bark. So there's one bark, two bark, three bark, you get the idea. All right, so this is a series of barks, and what's really interesting about it is the fact that we see here at the beginning, we see this big, massive, spread out energy associated with noise, right? Remember I mentioned that was noise. And here we have these really discrete little bands as well, right afterwards, and those are tone. Along with that, we have a change in the frequency. So it's not just a straight line. It's actually, you can see it a little better on some of the overtones, but it's a curved tonal line. So it's starting low, going high, dropping back down to low. And so we have both low-pitched noisy sounds and high-pitched tonal sounds all conveniently packaged in one little vocalization. So according to Morton's motivation and structural rules, this vocalization means, come here, go away, which is the opposite message, right? So this, this is the first piece of evidence that this may be a conflict um, vocalization. So this may be due to internal um, state of conflict. And I just wanted to make something a little bit clear here since we've been talking about conflict in slightly different ways. So one way we've been talking about conflict today is a conflict between two animals. So uh, over food, over what have you, there, there's some disagreement over, over some resource or something to that effect. This kind of conflict is an internal conflict. So the dog is sending two opposite messages. This is not doing one behavior, it's doing two behaviors at once. So this is an internal conflict that I'm talking about here, which is not completely unrelated, but I just wanna make that, um, that clear. So that's one thing that, that suggests that this second hypothesis might be happening. Now, to get to the second piece of evidence, I'm gonna show you this slightly scary graph, but it's not so bad. So up at the top, all it's showing is a bunch of different structural measurements. So this just the T means tonal, N means noisy, M means mean pitch. These are all different um, structural things. 
uh, pulse repetition, all those structural things I talked about, duration, frequency, tonality, all those things are up there. And it turns out even though dogs vary their barks between contexts, even including that variation, it is possible with a little bit of work to find some structural things that characterize the sound of the bark, even with that variation. So, and not only can we do this, and this was actually from a paper that I wrote back in 2009 with some colleagues, um, we can do this and discriminate the bark from other canine vocalizations, like the yelp and the growl and the whine and the howl. So we can actually have this acoustic definition of the vocalization, which might seem a little silly, because like I mentioned, at three, you knew the dog barked. You hear a bark, you feel like you know what it is. But when we're talking about measuring things, when we're talking about comparing things, we really do need that, that definition, so we're all on the same page about what the vocalization is. And so this lets us do that. Not only does it let us say what we're talking about, but it lets us compare this vocalization across species. So once um, I had this, I went out into the literature and looked at other animals making vocalizations and saw if there were any animals out there making vocalizations that matched these structural components. Interestingly enough, the thing that tends to discriminate the bark from everything else is this tonal noisy component, having both at the same time. So I went out into the literature and to see what else produced the bark. Well, not a big surprise, as we mentioned before, wolves, jackals, um, uh, coyotes, all of the canis produce it. But they weren't the only ones. We also see that a bunch of primates produce this sound. A whole bunch of birds produce this sound. A bunch of undulates, the deer family, produce this sound, and even some rodents produce this sound. And so it turns out a whole bunch of species are making the bark sound. In fact, in a lot of these papers, along with giving the structural components, they would even mention that it sounded a lot like the dog bark. These deer here, munjak deer, are actually also known uh, colloquially as barking deer. So it wasn't just us noticing this, um, this comparison. It was something people had noted before. And what was even more interesting was unlike the dog who produces this in multiple contexts, every other species that produces this sound produces it in a single context, and that is conflict, usually associated with mobbing. Again, Patricia mentioned mobbing before. She set me up really nicely today. So um, mobbing behavior occurs when an animal is at a den or a nest site, so with offspring, and something potentially dangerous approaches. Now, normally, if an animal uh, sensed a potential predator, they'd run away, hide, something like that, right? Avoid the hazard, get out of dodge. But if you have your offspring there, if you run away, you're putting your offspring at risk of predation, not adaptive. You kill your offspring evolutionarily, really bad idea. So this animal is now has that internal conflict. They would normally do one behavior. They are internally motivated to do this behavior, to run away, and yet, they're also motivated to stay on their ground. And these two things are in conflict with each other. So not only do they produce this sound, this bark sound, but they also move towards and away from that potential predator. So if it's a bird, you'll see them swooping and swooping away and swooping towards. If it's a, 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 um, a terrestrial animal, you'll see them running towards and running away. If it's a climbing animal, you get the idea. Um, and most of you have probably seen this, this, um, this behavior in birds. You'll see, a big, you'll see a big crow or a big predatory bird, and you'll see little tiny birds flying around them, towards them and away from them, and you kind of think they're crazy, but that's, that's the behavior that they're performing there is mobbing. So it seems this hypothesis suggests, based on this information, that barking varies between contexts, but it's not varying because of those specific contexts. It's varying based on how the animal feels, specifically conflicted. Um, and that if that's the case, if animals are producing barks because they're conflicted, then dogs might produce barks a lot more because they're a lot more conflicted than all the wild animals. And that this increase in conflict is the result of domestication. Now, this is an important difference between the first hypothesis. The first hypothesis suggests dogs bark more because they've been selected to do so. This was a specific adaptation, be it natural or artificial, doesn't matter really, but they've done this to communicate with us, very specific function driven. In this case, 
dogs were domesticated, and just as kind of a tag along, just by coincidence, it caused them to bark more. So how could that happen? Well, the possibilities for increasing conflict are several. The first is when you domesticate animals and then eventually bring them into the home or into the domestic environment, we now start doing things to them that constrains them. So we put a dog on a leash, we put a dog on a chain, we put a dog in a house, in a car, behind a fence, in a crate, all of those things restrict the animal's movement. So now they're frightened of something. They want to run away, just like that animal who's mobbing. They want to run away, they can't run away. They're conflicted because they can't do that behavior that they are motivated to perform. Alternatively, they may want to approach something. There may be something rewarding out there they'd like to get to and they're constrained and they can't do that. So again, conflict, they can't do what they want to. Can't do what they're motivated to do. Another uh, way we can get increased conflict is by having a shorter flight distance. So this is something that actually was selected for during domestication. We think that, animal, that dogs were domesticated in order to um, fit into a niche that was our garbage dump. So we produced garbage, great niche to this day, lots of food in there, lots of resources in there, as you saw in Ray's talk. And in order to take advantage of that resource, you have to be able to stay in the dump even when people are approaching and dumping food. If you are an animal, like a wolf today, trying to scrounge in a garbage dump, and you hear someone approaching and you run away and you stay away, then you're losing all that energy and you're not gaining energy from the garbage dump. So you're spending energy running away, you're not sticking there eating, not very adaptive. If you can hold your ground and keep eating even when people are dumping food, you increase your energy in, you decrease your energy out, you're well adapted, you're behaving in a way that's gonna make you survive, that's a good adaptation for that dump. So being able to hold your ground, to shorten that distance that you allow something frightening to approach you. So flight distance is just how close you let that scary thing get to you before you start running and then how far you run. So dogs have adapted a very short flight distance. Even dogs that don't live in your house, even dogs that live in the garbage dump today have a very short flight distance. I like to compare them to pigeons in the park because everybody has good experience with that. You walk up to a pigeon and it lets you get pretty close, just close enough where you think you can maybe catch it. And then when you actually make that final grab, they like take two steps over and you can't reach them. That's what dogs are like in the dump. They, don't, they just don't let you quite get close enough. So what this has to do with conflict is once you let something get that close, it ends up being a really bad idea to run away. So just like what they teach you as a woman in a self-defense class. If you see someone really scary, a potential predator, someone who might do something bad to you right there, you don't turn around and run. If you turn around and run, they grab you from behind, bad deal. Instead, you stand there and you scream at them, right? You just go, ah, go away, you know, 911, whatever. That may be what dogs are doing. Once somebody gets that close, it may become conflicting. They want to run away, but now it's dangerous. It's a bad idea. It's not adaptive to run away anymore. And finally, of course, something that always comes up is they can learn. So if a dog produces a bark in a potentially conflicting situation, say, you have some food on the counter, they would like to have that food, if they can't reach the food, it's on the counter, they're conflicted, they bark, and you go, oh, there's food on the counter, and you put it on the ground, well, oh, that was great, I made this sound that food is on the ground, this is awesome. So they learn that that bark is associated with that reward, and they can keep producing it, opening the door, you name it. All right, so this is the second hypothesis. So now we have to test between the two. We've got a little support for each. We've got two good hypotheses. Which one is uh, better? So we need to test them. We need to run some experiments. So we have two different experiments. I'm gonna talk to you about them individually. So first we're gonna run through this first experiment which we tested to see if dog barks were in fact context specific. Remember that first hypothesis relies on the fact that dog barks are associated with specific context. So you produce the same sound for the same context. That allows you to be referential. In the second hypothesis, we would not expect that. We'd expect them to be varying between contexts, but not specific to those contexts. So how do you test this? Well, my students and I, we went to people's houses, and we brought a very fancy recorder with us, and we produced two situations. One was a stranger, one of the experimenters that was unknown to the dog, knocked on the door, and the dog barked. We recorded that bark from inside the house within one meter of the dog with our fancy schmancy recording equipment. And then we got the owner to play with the dog in a manner that they knew usually produced barks, and we recorded those barks as well. 
We did this with 13 different dogs. Six of them were mixed breeds and seven of them were pure breeds. They ranged in size dramatically from 7.5 pounds to 85 pounds and had many different developmental backgrounds. We had ex-working dogs, we had current working dogs, we had pets, we had, we had all sorts of things going on. And then we went and looked at the fundamental frequency of the barks in these two different contexts, as well as the tonality, so how noisy and how tonal were they. And we compared them between stranger and play. Now, if these barks were context specific, we'd expect a few things to happen. First of all, we'd expect that play barks and stranger barks would be significantly different from each other in their frequency. Even more specifically, based on that previous literature I mentioned before, we'd expect play barks to be significantly higher pitched than stranger barks. Now I'm gonna stop for a minute and explain this graph because I'm gonna be using it to explain all the predictions and results, so I just wanna get you oriented. So this is something called an interaction plot. On the y-axis, we have the, the thing we're measuring, in this case, fundamental frequency. And on our x-axis, we have our two categories, the play barks and the stranger barks. Each of those lines is associated with an individual dog. So you can think of it as the spotty line dog and the solid line dog, right? Those are each a dog. The spotted line dog produced a bark during the play situation, in our theoretical situation here, that was around, let's say, 700 hertz, all right? The stranger bark of the same dog was around 400 hertz in this picture, okay? So that's its own line. In our solid line dog, he produced a play bark that was around, let's say, 580, and a stranger bark that was around, let's say, 450, okay? Now, you see they had slightly different reactions. Their barks weren't perfectly the same, but they have this same trend. We have a higher pitch play and a lower pitch stranger. And if we just circle, if we just looked at these barks here and we compared them to these barks here, you'd all probably say, yeah, those are different, right? We see some difference there. There's higher and lower ones. So this is what we'd expect if we had context specific barking. If we didn't, we wouldn't expect to see any trend, it'd be a big mess, there'd be no difference between these two groups. We can make similar predictions about the tonality, so how noisy or tonal it was. We measure tonality in this case with something called Weiner's entropy. Weiner's entropy actually has a really interesting history with, with code breaking and all sorts of stuff, but basically it's a logarithmic scale with zero being white noise, so as noisy as we can make it, right? So perfect noise. And negative infinity is perfect tone. So the closer to zero, the less negative, the more noisy, and the more negative, the more tonal. The more like that lost call, we've got our, we've got our growl up here, okay? So we would predict, again, that if it were context specific, we would see a significant difference between the barks produced the, in the tonality, between the barks produced in the play situation and the barks produced in the stranger situation. And more specifically, we'd expect our play barks to be more tonal than our stranger barks. Again, we have our individual dogs here, our solid line dog and our spotty line dog. And again, they have slightly different reactions. One's a bit more tonal in play than the other, but they both have this same trend. And we look at all the stranger barks in comparison to all the play barks, we could say those are different. Now, if these were not context specific, again, we'd expect no difference between those two things. It'd be a big mess. All right, now that we have that under our belt, let's look at the results. <laughs> All right, <laughs> so, looks a little intimidating, but what this is showing, this is our fundamental frequency again, are two different situations. Each of these lines is an individual dog. And we can see some dogs that show that high-pitched tonal play bark and a low-pitched, sorry, high-pitched play bark and a low-pitched stranger bark. So we see some dogs with this line that we expected here. But we also see some dogs that don't show a really big difference between the two, and some dogs that show the exact opposite from what we expected. That one's really bad. So we have a really deep play bark in comparison to the stranger bark. And when we look at all the points over here, all our play points and all our stranger points, we can't say that those are significantly different. We run the statistical tests. For those of you interested in it, this was a repeated measures ANOVA, and we found no statistical significance difference between those two. So no difference. Let's look at tonality. Again, remember we have 
more noisy up here, more tonal down here, and we have some dogs, again, that showed what we expected with a more tonal play bark and a more noisy stranger bark. But we also have some that don't vary a whole lot and some that go completely in the opposite direction. Who have a more tonal play bark, uh, a more noisy play bark and a more tonal stranger bark. And if we look at all of the animals that produce play barks and all of the animals that produce stranger barks, we see no difference. Statistical test shows it's not significantly different. Now, because we had these results where we didn't see um, any sort of association with the context, we also wanted to check the association between fundamental frequency and tonality. So is there any relationship going on between how tonal a bark was and how, and how high pitched or low pitched it was? And this was of interest because of those structural rules. If Morton's rules are in play, we'd expect there to still be some relationship where we still had, when you were producing a high pitched bark, whatever situation that was in, it should be more tonal. And whenever you were producing a low pitched bark, regardless of when that was, it should be more noisy. So this is something called the correlation on the, oops, <laughs> on the y-axis we have our tonality, on the x-axis we have fundamental frequency. So what this shows is that when we have a dog producing a bark up here that's really noisy, it is also producing a bark that is a really low frequency. And as we move across this graph, we see as we continue to move up on our frequency, so it's getting higher and higher pitch, it's also getting more and more tonal. It's got that nice diagonal line. Now a perfect correlation would be a perfect line from this left corner to this bottom right corner. That would be a perfect negative correlation. And that would be something called an R, that's what measures this, an R of negative one. We have an R of negative 0.81, which is pretty darn nice. And it's also statistically significant. So we are seeing a really nice, a really nice relationship between these two things. So what does all this mean? Well, what the data is showing us is that while dog barks do seem to vary between contexts, they do not seem to be context specific. Instead, we are seeing sort of uh, no significant difference between these two things. It's just a big mess. But in this mess, we are still seeing a relationship between frequency and tonality that would be predicted by these rules, by these motivation structural rules. So that's still a possibility. So overall, this data supports our second hypothesis, that that difference, in, um, that difference in sound isn't due to specific context, but rather due to internal motivation. So what may be happening there, if, so this, this hypothesis suggests when you see that dog that's producing a really high-pitched tonal stranger bark, it is in response to the stranger on the other side of the door, but this dog may be viewing the world very differently from the dog that's producing a low-pitched noisy bark in response to the same context. So the dog on the left here, who's producing a high-pitched tonal stranger bark, views strangers as a reward. Strangers are fantastic. We really want to get near that stranger. And so they are conflicted because there's a door in the way and they can't get to that reward. So they produce a bark but they, are, they are, have an internal motivation of affiliation, right? They, they want to be near that thing. It's rewarding. I want to get close to it. So even though they're conflicted, they are on the affiliative side of that scale. So they're producing a high-pitched, more high-pitched, more tonal bark. There's still some noise in there, but it's leaning towards the tonal end of the spectrum, and it's higher pitched, right? Like that play bark we heard. Whereas the dog that has a low-pitched noisy bark in response to the stranger is wary of the person on the other side of the door, is a bit nervous about this, is having more of an agonistic reaction, and would like to go the other way. And so they have a low pitch, um, I just said agonistic, <laughs> agnostic, yeah, that was right, okay, agonistic reaction, um, and so they'd like to go the other way. And so they're on the other side of that spectrum, they're low pitched and noisy. All right. So that moves to our next experiment. In this experiment, we wanted to test the reaction of dogs to bark. So think back to those vervet monkeys. When they played the sound in the absence of the context, the animals still had an adaptive response. So if dogs are, have a referential vocalization, if this is some kind of communication, we would expect there to be a specific response to these different types of barks. If it was not, if it was just a general internal um, state um, 
reaction, we would expect it to just be sort of a general, let's go look in that direction. No specific reaction, just an orientation response. And so um, I performed playback studies, just like Cheney and Seyfroth did, but now we're doing it with dogs and barks. So in this case, we had 23 dogs, again, a mix of mixed breed and pure breed dogs, a slightly smaller size range from, from 15 to 85 pounds. Um, Dogs were brought into a room with their owners. Their owners stayed with them the whole time. The owners sat down in a chair and kept their dogs in this little box pictured here. Um, we wanted their, them to keep the dogs in the same place because we were going to play them a bunch of sounds. And when you play sounds from a specific site, they actually sound different depending on where you are. Some people have special seats they like in movie theaters and stuff because the sound is better. So if you move further away from the origin of that sound, it'll be a lower amplitude, it'll be quieter. If you're closer, it'll be louder. If you're over in a corner, it may bounce and ricochet off things and change that vibration somewhat and alter the sound. So we wanted all our dogs to have the same experience. So the owner brought them in, kept them in this box, and then we played a sound. The first sound we played was silence. Yes, we played the sound of silence. And it was, in fact, we were playing a real sound clip. This was something we produced in a program called Sound Studio. So it wasn't just that we waited for a second. We actually played a noise through, a lack of noise, as it were, through speakers and um, saw how they reacted. This was the dog's control, so that each dog was its own control group. Then we played them one of two barks, either a play bark or a stranger bark. And these were barks we recorded from the first experiment and from a dog that had that predicted context-specific reaction. So from a dog that had a deep, noisy stranger bark and a high-pitched tonal play bark. In fact, it was the set of three barks that you heard at the very beginning of this talk. So that, those were the barks they heard. But we randomized which one they heard first. Once a sound was played, the owner let the leash go, and the dog was allowed to move around the room freely for three minutes or until it returned back to a calm, neutral state. And then we played them the next sound. While this was going on, we were recording the whole thing with video cameras and multiple angles. And after we were done, the, the videotapes were scored on two areas. One was whether or not the dog oriented to the sound when it was played. So at the start, it wasn't like there was a sound, silence, silence, turn around. It had to be with the sound. And then we were also looking at their motivational state. And we did this on a five-point scale. So a dog that showed um, very relaxed play behavior, we scaled as a one. A dog that was neutral was a three, and a dog that was very tense and even possibly showing some aggressive behavior was a five. Now, obviously, we have a long ethogram. As Patricia mentioned, those are really boring and slightly scary to look at, so I haven't shown you the whole thing here. But that's the general scale. So we coded dogs on each of those things. Now, if dogs are context, if parks are context specific, we'd have, again, some particular predictions. We have the same type of graph here with one alteration. I have a little red triangle here, and that is meant to represent the control state. So we'd expect, regardless of the hypothesis, that dogs would be fairly neutral in their behavior when they heard that silence. They shouldn't be doing anything, really. There's nothing happening, hopefully, that will spook them. That's why it's there, to make sure they are neutral. We'd expect, then, that they would behave in a manner that is specific to the bark that they heard. So if they hear the play bark and it's context specific, we would expect dogs to show a more relaxed state than they had during that neutral sound. So we'd expect them to go down on our scale. Remember, one is playful here, and five is very tense, possibly aggressive. So in our play, we'd expect our dogs to be more relaxed. And in our lost my sound. There we go. <laughs> in our stranger bark, we'd expect them to be uh, more tense. So again, two different dogs, two slightly different things going on here, but we can see these two would be different than these two, and both dogs have these same sort of trends happening. If this were an internally motivated sound, we would not expect to see this trend. We would not expect any significant difference between play and stranger for the motivational scale, but we would expect dogs to orient towards this sound, just a generalized response, just look at it, but nothing more specific than that. So these are the results. 
what we found, you'll notice this was 23 dogs, right? And yet we have only five lines here. So a lot of dogs were doing the same thing. In fact, most dogs, 10 out of our 23 dogs, were doing the same thing. Everybody had this nice neutral response to silence, which we really appreciated. Sometimes that doesn't happen. Um, so that made it easy for us. 10 of our dogs responded by being more tense regardless of what sound you played. So if it was a play bark or a stranger bark, either case, they became more tense. We had two dogs that actually increased, so they were neutral during the play bark, but they were more tense during the stranger bark. We had five dogs that were more tense during the play bark and more neutral during the, sorry, this is, sorry, I got it backwards. Okay, so we had five dogs that were more tense during the play bark and neutral during the stranger bark. We had five dogs who did absolutely nothing. You guys have some of those. And we had one dog who was more playful during the play bark and neutral during the stranger bark. Okay, so we, during the um, statistical analysis, we did not find any significant difference between these two groups here, between play and stranger. And when we looked at the order of the bark, there was no significant difference between the reaction for first bark versus second bark. For orientation, all of our dogs oriented except for three. Again, there's always some of them. So we had two of those dogs, however, that also, oops, that also compromised this group. So two of those dogs that didn't look also showed no motivational change. So they had zero reaction to the sounds. In fact, one of them was actually kind of funny because he sat there, we played the sound, two seconds went by, and he looked at his owner. And I'm like, did you, did you say something? I, <laughs> I thought I might have heard someone. So despite us asking beforehand if these animals were deaf, these were also our two oldest participants. So it was a 12-year-old dog and a 13-year-old dog. And we suspect they may have had some hearing issues, as did their owners after this experiment. So um, <laughs> they weren't really that helpful. Um, another interesting thing, despite the fact that we saw no order difference, it may come in, in handy when talking about this dog here, this one dog that did show more playful behavior during the play. Some of us are, you know, your hearts are leaping. My dog, you know, he understands the context. But um, this was the first sound he heard, and this was the second sound he heard. So when he heard the play sound, he wagged his tail. He's like, yeah, oh, and then he stopped, and he came neutral. And then the stranger bark played, and he was like, man, yeah, yeah, whatever. So it may have just been an order effect. We can't say, there's only one dog. Okay, so to sum it up, what did we find from this? Dogs' response to playbacks did not appear to be context specific. They were not reacting in a specific way to these two different sounds. But we did get this generalized orientation response to the sounds. So again, this supports the second hypothesis that barks are internally motivated through conflict. And it's interesting to note that all those other animals I talked about that produce barks in mobbing contexts and conflict contexts, they also have this generalized orientation response. So somebody makes this bark sound, and what happens is they look at the guy making the sound. But that's it. The only time they make a more specific reaction is when they locate the thing that he's barking about. So they kind of, oh, what are you? And they look over there, and over there, there's a capybara, and that's boring. So they go back to what they're doing. Or it's a capybara, that's horrifying, and they run away. Or it's a capybara, I don't know what to do about that. I'm going to bark too. So the only time they decide actually how to respond is once they see the actual stimuli, unlike a referential bark where it's in response, or a referential sound, which is in response to the vocalization. So in conclusion, dog bark, dogs seem to bark because they're conflicted, and dogs bark more because they're more conflicted than everybody else. So before I let you go, I just want to acknowledge the students that worked on this project so hard. So these are uh, four students from Gettysburg College, undergraduate students. From on the left, we have Melissa Rich, Gail Pitkern, ignore me, Kobe Rudakowitz, and Malcolm Bellin. And some references, um, in case you want to um, get a hold of any of these papers I referenced, I can give you, um, I can give you these later. And that's it. <laughs>